Hmm. Well, I think photography has an influence. It had an influence on the cartoon things because of the views of certain things. Uh, and I think they, it had an influence on my work because photography had an influence on cartooning itself. Uh, airplane battles and things like that are not something you see at eye level in the normal course of, of uh, painting a still life or a, a portrait. So to see a man in an airplane obviously takes the, you know, is the result of having seen a photograph somehow. Of course, I saw the cartoon, but I think those sort of uh, cinema-like shots, which are used a lot in, in cartoons themselves, were uh, influenced the character of some early work of mine. I don't think I'm not particularly interested in photography, I mean, as, a, as an art form. Uh, photographic thing plays some part in the printing process, so that, you know, the dots and all that have something vaguely to do with photography. That's probably Who not what you mean. Day? What's the origin <laughs> of that term? I've always meant to find out. And I don't actually... <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know that it has that, to do with the, in, the invention of, of having uh, some way of... Uh, instead of making a gray, of making little black and white dots on a screen, and they could be indicated by the uh, artist that this thing would be a 40% screen, and you that would mean the something. Bende dot in. And the printer mm -hmm. puts the bende on. What I... I'm imitating more than that is something like art type, which is a, a printed dot on a, a transparent f uh, foil paper of some sort that has a wax on it, and you burnish it down on your drawing, which some uh, cartoonists use, I guess. But, but it's supposed to in, uh, imitate printing, of course, but, and that form of that part of printing comes through photography in a way. So there's that influence. What do you think of the Wyeth show being held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art? <laughs> Before all these cameras and everything? <laughs> <laughs> Splendid idea. <laughs> and, that, and now without the cameras. <laughs> Still splendid. <laughs> Why do you think Henry Gale's I just saw gone? those debates last night. I can say oh. anything with a straight face. <laughs> you said you can say anything with a straight face. <laughs> Why do you think Henry Gelzala refused to act as the curator of that show? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. And your comment from the, uh, Mr. Castelli? Well, I won't repeat what he said, but I say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> How did you become a painter? <laughs> um, I don't know. I just went to art schools and things like that. You know, I, since the age of fifteen or so, thought I was going to be a painter. But you're also something of a collector. I. Uh, well, I don't think of myself that way. I, I don't. I doubt that I collect as much as many artists. I, I have some things, usually just things that I've happened to get a hold of somehow. I mean. It, I don't make any tremendous effort to collect. Um, what was the first thing that you got a hold of? Oh, well, I've collected things, you know, all, probably of artists you wouldn't know, and, you know, all through my life. I mean, just trading work or something. Um, I think it began before I can even remember who it was who I collected, but I did get some certain things, like uh, some Andy Warhol drawings, which I got, which were at Leo's early. And, um, some Oldenburg, so I have some, but they're, they're drawings, these things, usually, I don't have, I have some of Andy's paintings, and things like that. In a recent profile, uh, oh. where the interviewer was at your country house, he described the environment. That's also the not country house, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the it's only yes, house. it's the only house. <laughs> <laughs> I meant in the country. <laughs> I meant your house in the country. It's okay. Um, <laughs> And the description included an environment that sounded as if it was filled with Warhols. Well, and the room we were in had, had Warhols, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Ozenfant, well, I have an Ozenfant, I have a couple of Miro drawings. Mm -hmm. but, but I think there are, there are artists that really collect, and I, um, I know Stella really not, collects uh, uh, not very many, well. Not many, really, I would say. Well, uh, uh, mostly do it a bit uh, as casually as you do. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, Frank has quite a bit, Stella. And, mm. uh, Nope. Well, of uh, <laughs> the people, uh, yeah. more specifically mm -hmm. of the painters that he admires, that have had uh, an influence on him, like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Reinhardt, for instance. I remember his buying the first painting that he bought 
uh, when he was quite young and didn't have any money, was a, an Ad Reinhardt painting. Well, some collectors become dealers. Here you are, a Trieste-born businessman, and arrive in New York in about, was it 1947? No, no, earlier than 42. that, 41. But in 1951, mm -hmm. you did put together, before you became a dealer, what is now considered a celebrated show on 9th Street. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Well, actually, uh, just to go back a little bit, uh, I had uh, uh, set up a gallery in Paris before I came to America. So when I got here, well, I got interested in what was going uh, on here, and I knew quite a few people, like uh, Julian Levy, for instance, uh, who had the gallery at that time, and I knew quite a few artists that uh, soon after the uh, outbreak of the war came over, like, uh, well, Duchamp, uh, Léger, and so on. So I, I was right in the midst of that uh, environment, uh, right from the beginning, uh, when I got here to America. Uh, I uh, saw Peggy Guggenheim uh, right away at that time, Pollock even before, uh, the very early Pollocks. So uh, uh, then uh, at that moment uh, I didn't have uh, funds or possibility of doing anything uh, and right, uh, very, very shortly uh, after my arrival I got into, into the army and into the war. And so uh, I really could begin some kind of activity only uh, after I got out of it in '46. That's when I really uh, began to go around and uh, uh, got to know the artists like uh, de Kunig, like Pollock, and so on. Uh, so my knowledge of those artists, I didn't have really much to do. I was sort of a private dealer. I did what I could do uh, with paintings that my associate in Paris, who still had the gallery going, was sending over here, so that uh, made uh, a livelihood for me. But uh, my <coughs> chief occupation really was to, to spend time, my time and life with the artists uh, uh, down on 10th Street at the Cedar Bar and so on. So uh, at one point uh, we had a club uh, uh, that was sort of formed in, back in 40, 48, I believe. And all the artists of that group and other people uh, used to come and we used uh, to discuss uh, various uh, matters. And then the idea came up of doing a show of all these people that the museums uh, really didn't want to touch back in 51. You know, Pollock, David Smith, all those. And we set up this uh, Ninth Street show in an empty uh, uh, store that uh, was in a house that was going to be demolished. And we got it uh, for, for very little, uh, for a period of two months. I think we paid $150 for the whole thing. And then, uh, with the help of the artists, uh, uh, we painted the walls. Uh, Franz Klein made an announcement. Uh, uh, I was the only one who had a little money. And believe me, it wasn't much. I contributed something like five or $600 to the enterprise. So then we had a solemn opening uh, back in 51, that was in May. And uh, there were lots of people uh, that came, including uh, Alfred Barr and uh, people from other museums. And was this uh, the counterpart to the Salon de Refusé? That was the counterpart, as we saw it, to the Salon de Refusé. And it was a, really a great success. Uh, unfortunately, Roy wasn't, wasn't around yet. But Rauschenberg uh, <laughs> uh, was part of it. Yes. Uh, I think that uh, of the younger people, uh, that uh, I have in my gallery, only Rauschenberg really... Uh, no, there was another painter who now is with uh, uh, with Rubin, Friedel Zubas, mm -hmm. who was in the show. Uh, that's about uh, all. Apart from that, uh, there was, of course, uh, all the major painters, Klein, uh, Pollock, uh, David Smith, uh, de Kooning, and so on, and they all had worked very hard to put the show together. Well, you've not only spawned a generation of artists, but dealers and collectors, too. Um, what do you consider, who do you consider to have some of the most finin finest collections of American art in this country or any place in the world? What uh, are the outstanding collections? Well, uh, there were some outstanding collections here in America. A uh, few of them uh, have uh, been dispersed. Uh, it's very regrettable that, for instance, uh, uh, Ben Heller dispersed uh, his great collection of uh, unique 
collection of abstract expressionism. But then everybody has his reasons for doing it, and you can't say uh, how silly of him to do it. He probably had to do it for some reason or another. Uh, another one, another great collection that was also dispersed, was being dispersed, is uh, Skull's collection. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the main collection... <laughs> Reality and truth. Uh, fortunately, the Tremain collection is still all together and is probably uh, uh, going to be given to the National Gallery in Washington. Whose main collection? Uh, Tremain. Tremain. Oh, Tremain. I'm uh, sorry. Burton and Emily Tremain. Yes. Uh, so that's For the new wing of the National Gallery? Uh, in the new wing of the National Gallery. Has that uh, been announced? That will make the National Gallery with other acquisitions that they have made, like the famous uh, uh, Pollock that they just bought, uh, uh, Lavender Mist, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, will really uh, make the National Gallery into one of the best galleries of modern art in the country. Has the acquisition of the Tremaine collection been announced yet? No, that has been not announced yet, because after all they're still alive and they don't want to, to get buried on that occasion. You know? What is the range <laughs> of that collection? It's, uh, uh, it has a large, it begins uh, uh, with the beginning of the century, includes Europeans. That's, uh, sh it's a little bit unique in that way because most of the great collections like skull, skulls did not include Europeans. So this includes uh, uh, Europeans from the beginning, uh, good examples uh, say of Picasso, uh, Braque and so on, uh, up to uh, uh, Liechtenstein and, and farther. Uh, so that will, uh, that's, a, that, that's a very good collection. Not uh, too many paintings but uh, very well chosen. Another great collection that's still uh, uh, alive and kicking is Weissman's collection in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And the newer one is in San Francisco and belongs to uh, a man called Hunk Anderson. He began only five or six years ago. It has uh, a marvelous collection, uh, not uh, in San Francisco itself, although some of his paintings are at the museum, but uh, in a place called Atherton, where he has his uh, business uh, uh, when well, his business uh, radiates from because it's a very large business. What about our Texas uh, friends? Uh, let me see if I don't forget anybody who might no be terribly... No one in Houston? Uh, well, Houston there is really, well, apart from uh, the fantastic De Vinyl collection, which is very, very special. You can't really uh, compare it to anything else in the world. It's varied, it includes everything. And it's chosen, let me flatter you a little bit, uh, in the same spirit that uh, your collection is chosen in that spirit, all kinds of uh, extraordinary things uh, to include uh, 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 oceanic, oceanic art, uh, Negro art, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, even uh, paintings, uh, Renaissance paintings, uh, they have an absolutely marvelous little cloué painting. Uh, and anything they can think of, just chosen with an eye to, to its perfection. They also have uh, recent paintings, of course, uh, I don't uh, <laughs> There was a Krauscher collection, but that got... Oh, uh, there was a Krauscher collection, but I have to mention other great <laughs> collections that are not here, unfortunately, uh, but contributed enormously to, uh, well, make uh, the market here and even call attention of uh, uh, collectors here, museums here, to the fact that uh, American art was uh, more important than these museums or these collectors thought. And uh, that's the Ludwig collection uh, in Cologne, at the museum. Well, it's a private collection, but he's giving it to uh, the Cologne, to a new museum, actually, that he's going to build in Cologne. For the moment, it's housed in the old museum. And he's the only, only person in the world that uh, has, say, uh, something like uh, 12 Liechtensteins together in the same room. They have Liechtensteins over at the Modern or at the Whitney, but they show only one at a time, or perhaps none, because they haven't got the space. He's got the space to show uh, eight Jasper Johns, uh, 12 Liechtensteins, uh, nine uh, Rauschenbergs, and so on. That's probably the greatest collection uh, of, say, of the 60s uh, in the whole wide world. And if people want to go and see Jasper Johns or Rauschenberg or Liechtenstein or Rosenquist and the others, they have to go to Cologne. It is not found anywhere in, in America. Another great collector that I want to mention is uh, an Italian, and it's Panza, Panza di Biumo who is more uh, <coughs> idiosyncratic, he omits certain painters uh, for some uh, complex uh, uh, reasons that uh, many cases are not, uh, not easy to understand. So he has, for instance, uh, something like 20, 25 uh, Oldenburgs of the early period. He has, uh, uh, I don't know, 
six or seven very important early Rauschenbergs, some Lichtensteins and so on. But you see, the real reason why he's so idiosyncratic is that he buys only at the beginning, when he discovers them, as I do, at the same time practically, and he can have them for very little money, then they become too expensive. Or in cases like Jasper Johns, whom he liked very much, where there was never enough available to, to please him. So he would come and say, well, how, uh, what Jasper Johns do you have available? So I said, well, there is this one painting. He says, I never buy one painting. <laughs> List making uh, at best is, not, is neither gratifying nor definitive. We're going to ask each of our guests each week to, regardless of price or availability, what your favorite painting, sculpture, or work of art might be. Roy? <laughs> oh my goodness. You mean? Uh, any place, any, anywhere, any, place, any, any period, anywhere. any period, right. any location. Well, what I can think of is uh, Girl Before a Mirror, which is you know the Picasso that uh, the Museum of Modern Art has. That's in sculpture. Let's see if you if you think you like sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to forget something monumental. Do you have to like sculpture? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like some sculpture, and I would say that. Uh, Whenever somebody asks me which my favorite uh, sculpture is, it's uh, Brancusi's Bird in Flight. Oh, well, that's a pretty good one. And um, painting? Uh, that's more difficult to answer. I think that you would respect Picasso, but he is not one of your favorite painters. Well, uh, I really never uh, dealt in Picasso. I never. Perhaps it was uh, uh, when I was really uh, bu uh, buying or handling uh, important uh, artists, uh, European artists, like, uh, say, Leger, whom I like very, very much, and uh, Giacometti, or... Uh, I always uh, thought, uh, somehow, that Picasso was beyond my means. Uh, it was sort of an uh, utter respect that uh, did not uh, permit me to handle Picasso. Certainly is uh, very great, and uh, I, I couldn't say which one of Picasso's painting is my favorite. Uh, is it... Uh, the Demoiselle d'Avignon. I would say the Demoiselle d'Avignon, mm -hmm. really. What is of your course, most uh, prized possession? My what? What is your most prized possession? My most prized possession? <laughs> hmm, there are several. <laughs> uh, to speak about uh, uh, people present, uh, namely Roy here, uh, I think that his uh, Washington, Portrait of Washington, is one of my very favorite paintings. I have uh, uh, Jasper John's flag, which I like very much. Uh, uh, just by John's target uh, with plaster cars, and of course uh, 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 Rauschenberg's bed. But I like other things just as much. Uh, I like, for instance, certain of the jod progressions enormously, and uh, uh, say the monuments to, to Tatlin uh, of Flavin, uh, my favorite uh, uh, works of Flavin. So there are many things that I, that I love. Roy, did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it did? No, no. Um, can't elaborate on that. I just, uh, I just didn't. I mean, I had no notion of it. Yeah. Yes, it's it's really quite uh, quite incredible. Uh, well, it uh, depends very much uh, on the character of the painter, what he does uh, with his work, how he handles it. Uh, there, are, uh, Roy has been going on from one thing to the other, working constantly. Uh, Jasper Johns. Uh, produces a group of works and then for years sometimes he doesn't do much except perhaps prints or drawings. So it's very spotty. He has adopted uh, the attitude that unless he uh, feels that he can do something uh, that's uh, new, uh, he just uh, prefers not to do anything. That's a very Duchampian attitude too. Uh, Rauschenberg has uh, invented an infinite variety of themes uh, some of them uh, uh, extremely uh, sellable, let's say, in quotes. Others uh, almost impossible uh, to, to place in a private collection, especially because uh, they're either huge or flimsy. Uh, so there are many, many problems. But he's been, like Roy Rauschenberg, uh, immensely productive. The difference is that uh, in the case of Roy, uh, his production has been always uh, uh, extremely, uh, has been in demand and was very, very easy to, uh, to sell. 
Well, thank you, Roy Lichtenstein. Lichtenstein, excuse okay. me. Mm -hmm. Leo Castelli, both of you, both of whom produce an art that lasts and can sus be sustained on many levels. And I thank you both for joining us tonight. And what we'd like to do now is to have the class share in the interviewing process. We have to change the camera. Woody had been that well known 20 years ago that that was a print that I had and not the original. He's probably working for Harper's Bazaar since it was a shoe. Uh, he was an illustrator uh, at Harper's Bazaar, and he often did do shoes in that period. Yeah, he was an And certainly then, he did do shoes, but, but at, for Harper's well Bazaar yeah. is the point, not yeah. for the Andy Warhol that you know. He was then a magazine uh, illustrator, and I don't know. Doesn't it sound as if it might fit into that period? Oh yes, it fits into the uh, period, the pre, the pre Andy Warhol period. I really don't know much about uh, uh, the period that preceded his, uh, let's say, pop uh, uh, period, because he doesn't really want to talk about it. Well, every now and then, if the spirit moves you, research the pages of Harper's Bazaar in the 1950s, and you will find uh, lots of illustrations and sketches by Andy Warhol. But would they be originals of those, or would those have been Oh, yes, there are originals. There are originals. There are. Occasionally, people come and show them to me. I even have one now at the gallery. It's a cat. A pussycat, like that pink pussycat. And strangely enough, uh, he recently did a series of cats and dogs. So he came back to that theme later on, but uh, done in a very different way. Yeah. Mr. Costello, please comment on the artist and this particular painting that was. I can't even really see if it was painting. They're felt hangings by Bob Morris that you're referring to. Could you tell us a little bit about it and why you chose this artist and this particular work? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the show is not complete. Uh, he just started hanging it. Uh, there will be, uh, let's see, uh, one here, uh, opposite the black one, uh, the white one, because you have the uh, one black one and then the same thing in white. Uh, here, for instance, uh, uh, then corresponding to this one here, you have a white one uh, facing it, and correspond, uh, corresponding to that one there, you have a black one facing it. Or perhaps uh, he'll hang them diagonally, I don't know what he'll do. But anyway, uh, he's been uh, using this medium, felt, uh, for a very long time. And uh, if you're interested, uh, come one day, and uh, I could show you uh, how, uh, how these things have changed through the years. I think it's at least 10 years that he's been using felt, if not more. And uh, there is an infinite variety uh, of, uh, uh, that is done. And you have to conceive of them, well, uh, just to simplify matters, perhaps as uh, reliefs. They are not in metal or in wood, but they are reliefs in paint. Now, he is uh, uh, not only uh, just briefly a, a minimal artist, as I said before, he has, uh, he has a very wide range of interests. Uh, he can be surrealist, he works with tapes, uh, so uh, he uh, is also a land artist. He uh, built a, a huge observatory near Amsterdam. Well, not a real one. <laughs> so, uh, well, one would have to say a great deal about, uh, about uh, uh, models, but it can be done uh, in a few minutes uh, in these particular circumstances. But if you're interested, uh, Janelle here, one of my uh, girls who has the photographs, can show you how the fence evolved from, well, the beginning uh, to this series here. The man in the blue shirt. I was wondering, Mr. Castelli, or Mr. Lippenstein, to what extent your own aesthetic judgments have influenced the artists that you have shown? Is it, did, did these people just come to you with their work, or has there been some other process also involved? Well, I think that question is directed to you, Leo. I think that he wants to know to what degree and extent your judgment, your sensibility, your aesthetic has influenced the work of your artists. Well, artists is that yeah, correct? Right. Uh, hardly uh, at all, I would say, except, well, uh, in the choice of, uh, of, that I make of a group of paintings, uh, I will prefer, say, three or four uh, 
above, uh, let's say, the rest. And I will uh, probably express this, uh, saying it to Roy that I like this one or that one particularly, that might uh, very indirectly influence him. Uh, in the next series, he sort of uh, can uh, figure out uh, what elements in a work of art uh, <coughs> I, I do prefer. Uh, and there I have to say something that uh, may interest you. Uh, in the beginning, uh, Liechtenstein did uh, uh, two types of paintings, uh, some very formal ones, uh, where form uh, was an important element, and some uh, which uh, uh, were more related to the comic strips uh, that were funny. Now, I liked uh, his, uh, uh, the paintings uh, that just uh, for their formal elements and didn't particularly care about uh, the contents, I think that Ivan Karp uh, was uh, quite involved with, with the content too, and so Ivan would express uh, his enthusiasm about that particular group and I uh, about the other. Now, I suppose that uh, perhaps it's not true at all that uh, what I felt about uh, that particular group uh, had uh, a certain influence on Roy, and he perhaps uh, uh, little by little uh, or very soon abandoned uh, the, uh, the funny content, content in the paintings. I don't know if it's true, you perhaps say, say something about Can we ask the same that. question to Will at this time? What, do you think that Mr. Castelli has influenced you? Maybe I'm entirely you? wrong there. I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going home to do a lot of funny paintings. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I really don't know. You know. I think anybody's appreciation will have some sort of influence, but I don't think I perceive that way. I just, uh, I start with something that I like, and it might wind up one way or another, and I'm not sure I could even predict how, what direction I'll go in. You know, I, do, I really don't know. You know, I don't. But just to uh, conclude that, <coughs> I would say that, uh, generally speaking, here in this gallery, the painters do what they like, and they are never refused or rejected. Maybe if there is a group of 12 paintings, say, uh, I will, and they need 10, I will eliminate two that I think less good. That's the only uh, only thing that uh, only influence that I have, <laughs> and even then the artist may say, "I want those two paintings in the show," and then of course I say, they have, they, "If you want it, they'll be in the show." Is that the way it works? Yes, <laughs> but I, I think that it's. Uh, I don't know whether that would really influence anyone. It is I think because there are a lot of influences yeah. and. Uh, after you all, know, there are other friends, other friends, people. Yeah. Yes, and obviously there are your own likes and dislikes apart from that, and. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's just the same sort of thing as people have asked if they're an influence to remain the same or something. And then I would say, well, then maybe, but there's also an, uh, an expectancy to change. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, and so that very lack of consistent style yeah. is what often baffles your more formalist <coughs> critics. Yeah, so it's, I think I would do what I want, but I imagine I'm influenced in a certain way, just as anyone would. Yes. I've got two questions. Well, let's take one for openers, because there are a lot of people who've raised their hands. When you were speaking before of the price skyrocketing of that one painting at Park Burnett, it, it, brought, it brought to mind something that I had read of some of your peers starting a, uh, basically, a, a price re uh, percentage resale clause in, uh, for future sales. I was wondering how you personally feel about that. As I far think as fairness to the buyer as I well think as the artist. What the questioner is asking is a very central question, and that is artist's <laughs> rights. Mm -hmm. If an artist sells a picture at X dollars, and the collector then resells it at three X dollars, to what 100. do... <laughs> or 100 <laughs> X dollars, how much of that should belong to the artist, and what your attitude about those new contracts that were being entered into Actually, by some municipalities, the city yeah. of Seattle, California. and uh, law, yes, particularly for public art. I don't know. I'm not terribly enthusiastic about it. I uh, I don't think it will work. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to do that when it's sold by a secondary dealer who bought it from Leo. Let's say I think that that, that would be something we would, would have a because the painting is being sold almost. Uh, immediately at, a, at another price. Uh, the reason that I don't believe in, in uh, so much in uh, those things is that it isn't being sold the way sheet music is, you know, where you would get 
a certain amount. I mean, you're really selling it the way you sell a house, and it's sold, and that's it. I just don't. Exactly. But I don't think you would ever know. Suppose a well, painting was so were traded for two other paintings and some money, or some, I mean, all kinds of complicated ways the paintings are are traded, and um, it can be figured that the artist get a certain amount. It's fine if they want to send it to me, but I <laughs> I don't understand the logic really. Well, let me why. cite a specific instance. There's a legendary story about a John's painting that Leo Castelli owns. He bought it when no one else wanted it, at least the way I have been given to understand that story, for $1,200. About a year or two ago, that very same picture that he paid $1,200 for, since we are now talking about dollars and cents and not the aesthetics of it, was evaluated at $400,000. Do you think uh, that no. is an equitable distribution? Well, the artist, for one thing, could have saved one of his own work, and <laughs> for another, <laughs> for another, uh, it could be the price of being lower than it's worth. <laughs> I mean, it certainly can't hurt the artist, for, for, you know, in general, for his work to sell higher. And for to get a percentage of that, is fine. I mean, I, I just. I don't understand, though. How do you feel about why that? Why the same thing might be true with the house? I would say it, be, it would be eminently fair if uh, the artist, uh, or as he pointed out, the dealer, uh, could take advantage of this enormous uh, rises in prices. But I think it's uh, just impossible, uh, as he pointed out, too, to administer uh, a thing like that. There are swaps, there are exchanges. Uh, go and, uh, there'll be uh, just an immense number of loopholes that will be found to avoid this. Uh, but with new contracts, you, I assume the logistics are simplified. The logistics, uh, particularly with public art. What, what do you mean by public? When a city or a municipality yeah. or a state or the federal government yeah. um, commissions a work of art, yes. and sometimes doesn't always keep that work of art. Well, these, are, these cases are sort of rare. I would say that uh, a whole uh, apparatus uh, should not be built around uh, those uh, those uh, those uh, uh, rare cases. Also, uh, the only painters, uh, actually, uh, artists that would profit from it, uh, you know, uh, like that would be uh, the ones that, uh, that need it least. Yeah, if that money went to a general retirement fund yeah. for artists, or <laughs> <laughs> artists it would make sense. I would be entirely for that, even if uh, administration were cumbersome. Yeah. But uh, the artist uh, who really sort of uh, lives uh, very well with uh, Lichtenstein or just the German stars, who has... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell us the size of that country house. A great, uh, a great number of his own paintings, uh, and he also, and just the Johns in Grauschenberg and the others, took advantage, after all, of uh, the rise in prices. I don't think it's, uh, it's really called for, frankly. I'm not... Uh, there, uh, there's, there's something else that, that the artist, in this case, sort of condones the resale. I mean, you really want a painting to be held by a collector and not to be bought to be sold. That's right. And so. for the artist to participate in the appreciated value, as they say, is uh, means that he sort of condones these resales because he's going to make something on it. And I think and you really wanted to have I'd a loving home. Just have a loving home. Yeah. And I also wouldn't want to participate in the depreciation of a work, which isn't part of the law, of course. But uh, what happens if the price goes down? <laughs> Those are my feelings. I understand that there are other, other, another way of looking at it. But I, I, that, there are a lot of things I'd like to see done for artists, but that isn't one of them. For example? Well, I think some sort of uh, fund for older artists, or uh, funds for the exhibiting of younger art, one or the other. Or Do extreme. You know, it would come possibly from this resale of art. That would make some sense. And everybody would be, would be more enthusiastic in contributing to something like that and rather put another $10,000 in Roy's or uh, uh, Jasper's pocket. Yes. How did you and Ivan Karp get together and how do you feel about his empire across the street? Uh, how did we, did I and... Uh, Ivan how did Karp. Ivan come to work for you? Oh, well, in a very simple way, uh, I needed somebody uh, to, uh, to assist me uh, and... Uh, he was available. I knew him from. Uh, Han he had. Uh, he worked uh, at the Hansa Gallery at one point. That was a cooperative gallery. Uh, he and uh, Dick Bellamy actually were handling uh, the Hansa Gallery. That was back uh, in the middle middle fifties, right? Before before even uh, before I opened my gallery. So then, after the Hansa uh, Gallery uh, collapsed, 
uh, he went to work for Martha Jackson. He was not too happy there, and at that time I needed an assistant, and so he came. After all, one you know one communicates in the art world about all kinds of things, not only about prices, <laughs> about personnel and everything. So he was available, and I found that he, since I had known him, had known his activity for for years, I felt that he was the right man for me, and he was. <coughs> The blue blast. I it's have a question for Dr. Stanley. You mentioned that before Rauschenberg received his prize at the Biennale, that you had built him up in a way, tried to introduce him to the art scene. What sort of steps do you take in trying to build up a young artist in the art? What do you do in promoting Just the uh, art? Say, <laughs> say it the questioner yeah. referred to your mentioning of before the Biennale, you're building up and yeah. promoting the work on an international scale of Rauschenberg. Right. There are a number of people in this room who are closely identified with the world of art as painters, as dealers, yeah. as collectors. Mm -hmm. And the nature of that question was, how do you go about... Building them up? Well, one thing is, uh, is first uh, complete and total belief in that artist. If you don't believe in him, you can't build him up. Uh, I had really uh, a fanatical enthusiasm. You can't imagine how fanatical it was. Now everything sort of, uh, of course, uh, has taken its course and many uh, years have gone by. But how fanatical I was about uh, artists like Rauschenberg, like Jones, like uh, Liechtenstein and so on in the early times. And therefore I felt uh, it's almost like a mission to promote them. Uh, I was very uh, much assisted in that uh, work, as far, especially Rauschberg and Johns are concerned, by Alan Solomon, who uh, mm. did the splendid uh, show uh, uh, of, Ra of Rauschberg first and Johns afterwards at the Jewish Museum. And that was a, an incredibly influential event. Perhaps it was not understood uh, at that time how important it was, but certainly uh, contributed uh, very, very uh, enormously to, uh, to uh, Rauschenberg's getting the prize at the Biennale. And also, before that at Cornell, didn't he? Uh, uh, well, he worked at Cornell, but that was modest uh, compared yes. to what he did in here at the Jewish Museum. But you were cooperating uh, with him. In fact, oh, yes. I, that was a question I wanted to ask earlier, and that is the relationship that you have with museums. Well, uh, first, uh, in the early days, uh, in my Salad days, uh, it was uh, immensely respectful of, uh, of this great man of the past, like, like Bach. I hardly dared to talk to him. <laughs> and he condescended to exchange a few words. I felt uh, highly honored. It still would be if poor Alfred were still uh, his, uh, in, very, in a very bad way, as you know. Uh, he's in a, in a home and uh, his mind is slipping. But uh, that was my first uh, uh, attitude to the museum directors. Now, uh, younger people whom I've grown up with uh, have replaced them, and they are all my friends. There is no problem anymore. <laughs> One last question. Mr. Cassell, I have a question to you. How do you find the new artists? Do they come to you, or do you go to them? And how many new artists do you put into your stable every year? <laughs> she <laughs> wants to know how an artist question. makes your yeah. grade, and I think you, you should know, know her I, husband I, is a painter. Uh, I see, uh, I see uh, something like... Uh, five artists a day. <laughs> they come to the gallery with the most uh, varied stuff. And uh, my constant, uh, very kind answer, I try to be as kind as I can, uh, and it's the, the honest truth that I really can't take on anybody now anymore because I'm chock full with artists and they couldn't, there's not enough space, not enough time uh, to attend to all that. But it's not the entire truth, really. Uh, I also try to give them advice to what other galleries to go uh, uh, and so on. But the entire truth is that artists that I would take into the gallery don't uh, come about except by an extraordinary accident, perhaps uh, that happened more in the early days. They have to fit uh, somehow, uh, uh, and I get them sort of in a more atmospheric, climactic way. They, they come up, uh, one hears about them, there are sort of uh, mysterious uh, things that happen that bring up uh, an artist out of, uh, out of nowhere. <laughs> One last question. Yes. Ask Roy, um, what you were talking about funny paintings before. Your painting is really beautiful and happy, and um, I I don't know. I feel guilty like sometimes if art is too beautiful. I think it's too decorative, and I know that formally your stuff is just so strong. I'm wondering 
painting for you like really an intellectual exercise or is the deepest part of you finding you expression? It? Or what's the purpose of making pictures for you? I think uh, all of those things, I think that it's really hard to talk about them, what really deeply motivates you. I, I have certain ideas which are obvious, they may even be superficial, and they're, you know, I mean, the general thing that the art seems to be saying is usually on a superficial level because that's the style that I'm uh, usually working on. I mean, some, it, it may even be a silly comment on something or something like that. But I'm trying to make uh, a strong painting, as you suggest. Uh, but trying to make one doesn't make one. Um, it is involved with everything about the way you think form ought to be, color ought to be. Uh, it gets involved with, you as you're actually putting the marks on, the painting and, and uh, a sense of where they should be and what they should look like and, and, and adjustments that are made. These things come from some central tendency or you hope it's basic enough to communicate with other people and that it reaches some innermost part of you. I mean, I don't want to get too, to make it sound too weighty, but, uh, but it must have that or otherwise it would have no possibility of communicating. It also takes someone who can see it too. Well, thank you for communicating with us orally as well. Thank you, Roy Lichtenstein and Leo Castelli, and thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you.